Thank you. My name is Mike Rubens with the State Water Resources Control Board Division of Water Quality. Together with my colleague Jonathan Pham with the Division of Water Rights, we will be presenting on how the State Water Board fits in with the cannabis cultivation permitting and compliance process. Just to give a roadmap of the presentation today, we'll start out with an overview of the Water Board structure, and then I'll touch on the different documents that guide our actions, the Cannabis Cultivation Policy and the Cannabis Cultivation General Order, and how these uh, affect you in your permitting process. Then I will hand it off to Water Rights to discuss uh, those requirements, as well as the application portal and some other additional resources. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm with the State Water Board Division of Water Quality and my colleague is with the Division of Water Rights. These are both based in our headquarters in Sacramento, along with our Office of Enforcement. We also have nine regional water quality control boards who are stationed throughout the state. Some of these regional water boards have joined forces to create regional cannabis units, for example, the South Coast Cannabis Unit or the Eastern California Cannabis Unit. These regional units are available to help with outreach and messaging. These are the entities that generally issue your cannabis cultivation general order permits or notice of applicability. Staff at the regions also determine compliance and sometimes initiate enforcement, but they are available to help with technical assistance as well. The primary components that the State Water Board Cannabis Regulatory Structure works under uh, involves a few documents or programs, the Cannabis Policy, the Cannabis Cultivation General Order, and the Cannabis Small Irrigation Use Registration, or SIUR. The Cannabis Policy describes the overall structure of the water boards and how we fit in with the other agencies that regulate cannabis cultivation. It also establishes water quality and in-stream flow requirements and other requirements that are conditioned in your permit. This policy may be updated as necessary and has been updated once before. This visual shows how the State Water Board Cannabis Cultivation Program fits in with Cal Cannabis's cultivation licensing. On the left side of this visual, we have the General Order Waste Discharge Regulatory Program, which is carried out by the State Water Board Division of Water Quality and the Regional Water Quality Control Boards. On the right side, we have the Small Irrigation Use Registration Program, which is implemented by the State Water Board Division of Water Rights. These are both required, or you need to check with the State Water Board to get a document to take to Cal Cannabis to prove that you have either obtained the permit coverage that you need or have proof that you do not need the permits that we offer before you can get your cultivation license with Cal Cannabis. Getting into the actual document itself of the cannabis policy, the main part of the document stresses how the water boards program fits in with the other programs that regulate cannabis cultivation, and it explains how our policy is enforced. Much of the meat and potatoes of this policy is included in attachment A. So the requirements for these permits and prohibitions for activities related to cannabis cultivation, as well as requirements for water diversion. Near the end of the attachment A and section five and six, are some useful documents and guidance that you will find helpful as you are applying. I just want to re-emphasize on this slide why we are carrying out these programs and requiring coverage for cannabis cultivation. We want to prevent activities that can lead to damage to fish and wildlife and the natural habitat. So these activities include illegal grading or illegal water diversions, improper storage of fuels, pesticides, or fertilizer, and things like clear cutting of trees that we want to prevent. The 
the Cannabis Cultivation General Order is the statewide program to protect water quality. And the order number is WQ 2019-0001 DWQ. And this number was updated when the policy was updated. As I mentioned, this is implemented by the State Water Board Division of Water Quality, along with the regional water boards. And this is required coverage for the CDFA's kale cannabis license. You may hear this heard, referred to as the water quality permit or a water quality protection program by other agencies. If you hear that, they are likely referring to the Cannabis Cultivation General Order Notice of Applicability that you will receive after you apply. The structure of the Cannabis Cultivation General Order coverage is broken out into two different facets, the first of which, discussed on this slide, the disturbed area size. Tier one enrollees uh, will have disturbed area equal to or greater than 2,000 square feet, but less than one acre. If your disturbed area is greater to or greater than or equal to one acre, you will be enrolled under the tier two category. And this disturbed area includes not only your cannabis cultivation area, but other areas where activities associated with developing or modifying land for cannabis cultivation related activities occur. And this can include, include areas where soil amendments or fertilizer are stored, areas where plant growth has been modified, or in some cases, your access roads. And this is this added because roads that are constructed and maintained consistent with the roads handbook are not considered disturbed area for the purposes of your general order enrollment for cannabis cultivation. And again, I want to stress that your disturbed area is always greater than your cultivation area. The other facet of general order coverage is the risk determination. For low risk, we have sites that are have disturbed area located on a slope less than 30%, and your disturbed area is located outside of the riparian setbacks. I'll have more information about the setback requirements in a moment. The moderate risk category is for sites with a disturbed area slope greater than 30%, but less than 50%. You will still need to comply with the riparian setback requirements to be in the moderate risk category. The high risk category is for sites that do not comply with the riparian setback requirements. These riparian setback requirements are similar to the watercourse classes that were mentioned by Fish and Wildlife with the perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral watercourses. Depending on which watercourse class, this riparian buffer is more restrictive. So for perennial watercourses, the setback is 150 feet. And moving down through this table, we have smaller buffer requirements for man-made water bodies. Please refer to the water course definitions in the cannabis policy attachment A and work with a qualified professional or seek technical assistance from your regional water board if you have questions about this. We also offer a couple different indoor conditional waivers for sites that qualify. So the indoor conditional waiver is for sites with a permanent roof or permanent rel and permanent relatively impermeable floor. So notably, this does not include hoop houses with a dirt floor or other similar structures. In addition to your activities taking place indoors, you will also need to discharge your wastewater to a sewer that accepts cannabis cultivation wastewater or have your wastewater stored and hauled away. You will also need to comply with the requirements in Cannabis Policy Attachment A and obtain a valid water right to be enrolled under this waiver. There is also an option for an outdoor conditional waiver, and this is for small commercial cultivation sites that total less than 2,000 square feet of disturbed area. The cultivation area must be contiguous or located all in one area. There is a 20% slope limit that you cannot exceed to comply with this waiver condition. 
And again, you'll need to comply with the requirements in attachment A and get a valid water right. The fee structure for the cannabis cultivation general order ranges from a fee of $600 for the tier one low risk category to an application fee of $8,000 for the tier two high risk category. Generally speaking, higher tier and higher risk categories are required to pay higher fees because of greater threat to water quality and greater oversight requirements. And conversely, the conditional exemptions are a pathway for lower fees for enrollment with us. After you apply, please refer to your notice of receipt for the Cannabis Cultivation General Order for more information about fee payment and other requirements based on your tier and risk category. The full fee schedule is available at our website, waterboards.ca.gov slash cannabis. Following the same logic as the fee structure, there are different technical report requirements based on your tier and risk category. All tier one and tier two enrollees will need to submit a site management plan when you apply. Sites that are enrolled under the moderate risk category will also need to submit a site erosion and sediment control plan. High risk enrollees will need to submit a disturbed area stabilization plan. If you are a tier two enrollee with a cultivation area that exceeds one acre, note that this is different than the disturbed area, you will need to submit a nitrogen management plan. Instructions for how to submit these will be included in your notice of receipt. Tier one and tier two enrollees are also required to submit an annual monitoring report. And if you have received your notice of applicability, you will need to report your annual monitoring, even if you did not have plants in the ground yet. And this is because there are other activities besides growing that may have impacts on water quality. This annual monitoring report is submitted through the same website as your application and we'll have more information on that application website in a moment. The annual report is due on March 1st, following the calendar year that monitoring is required for. The annual monitoring report will verify your compliance with the general order and ask you types, these types of questions, such as your facility status, site maintenance status, or stormwater runoff monitoring. Please be aware of what your monitoring requirements are when you enroll so you can collect this data. The monitoring report will ask you the questions that you need to answer based on your enrollment. So it's pretty helpful in that way. For people who have been enrolled and wish to terminate their enrollment, you will need to submit a cannabis order termination request form using that same program portal that I mentioned a moment ago. Tier one and tier two dischargers who wish to terminate their enrollment will also need to submit a final monitoring report. And this is an option within the annual monitoring report survey. This slide shows some of the helpful resources that are included in our regulatory documents. And for example, Section or attachment B has guidance on the monitoring and reporting program. Attachment C of the general order has guidance for the notice of termination. And attachment D has other technical report guidance to assist you with submit, submitting your reports. And with that, I will pass it off to my colleague, Jonathan Pham with Water Rights. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pham. I'm an environmental scientist with the Cannabis Registration Unit in the Division of Water Rights. I'm presenting the water rights portion of the State Water Board's presentation. So your first question may be, do you need a water right? Here we have a diagram answering that question based on your water source. Moving from the left to the right of this diagram, if you're diverting surface water, you will either need a small irrigation use registration, or an SIUR, or another valid water right. The 
SIUR program was made for commercial cannabis growers to rapidly obtain water rights to store water. Other valid water rights typically refers to senior appropriative water rights or pre-1914 rights, both of which must have uh, listed irrigation as a beneficial use in addition to allowing for long-term long -term storage. On the right side of the diagram, we have water sources exempt from a water right. The first being a fully contained spring. These are springs that do not leave your property. These are quite rare. And if you do believe that you have one, reach out to us and we can provide details on the exemption process. Other exempt sources include groundwater wells, water purveyors, such as like irrigation districts, uh, rainwater catchment. Uh, regardless of your water source, you'll still need to submit some type of water source documentation to Cal Cannabis. This will either be in the form of a water right or exemption documents that you obtain through the Water Board's application portal. Next slide, please. So what type of right do you need? Remember, the SIUR is, is for commercial cannabis cultivation. So for sale, trade, and barter, you'll need the SIUR. Other water rights can be used if they have irrigation as a use and enough storage to last you through the forbearance period. I'll touch upon the forbearance period in later slides. As for personal use, if you have six plants or yes or less, you can use the small domestic use registration, also known as an SDU. This also covers your domestic residential water uses. Next slide, please. So there are some conditions. You must comply with the general conditions, CDFW conditions, as well as the conditions in the cannabis policy. This allows you up to 6.6 .6 acre feet per year of diversion and a maximum instantaneous diversion rate of 10 gallons per minute. We find that most farms are requesting diversions much less than the 6.6 .6 acre feet. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a $750 registration fee and a recurring annual fee of the same amount. This permits diversions to storage during the wet season. So this is November 1st through March 31st. So on the opposite, this imposes a forbearance period in which no diversions are allowed from April 1st to October 31st. And that can potentially last longer depending on uh, flow rate data. Next slide, please. So during the diversion season, you can check to see if a diversion is allowed given your area. So for the main cannabis water rights page, there's a link to the online cannabis compliance gauge mapping tool. This mapping tool can be used during the diversion season to determine if there are sufficient flows to divert water for cannabis. The main justification of the forbearance period is to divert during times of high flow and store during times of low flow, which also overlaps with the grow season. Next slide. There are limitations, however. Uh, no water rights will be issued for diversions on fully appropriated streams in which there is no uh, water to allocate to new water rights holders. Wild and scenic rivers, and that could be protected at the federal or state level, and CDFW in-stream flow study areas. Next slide. Uh, so here we have on-stream reservoirs. Last year, there were updates to the policy to allow for on-stream reservoirs. Previously, they were prohibited. On-stream reservoirs are ponds that collect channelized surface flows. They are allowed if they're pre-existing prior to October 1st, 2016. If they were in the AB 2121 North Coast Policy Area, the reservoir must exist prior to July 19, 2006 on a Class 1 or 2 stream, or October 1, 2016 on a Class 3 stream. Next slide, please. Additionally, the State Water Board and CDFW will have to come to a determination that decommissioning the pond would be more environmentally detrimental than continued diversion into the reservoir. There are additional fees for on-stream reservoirs as opposed to the normal SIUR. So there's a $4,000 fee, bringing the initial fee to $4,750 for the on-stream reservoir SIUR. And the annual fees will be increased by $250, bringing the annual recurring fee to $1,000. Next slide. Now I'll provide an overview of the online application portal and process. Next slide. By following this link, on the page, you can reach the portal login and register page. Here you can register for a new account using a valid email address and apply for your water board's permits. This includes the Division of Water Quality's general order enrollment, as well as the Division of Water Rights SIUR application. Next. Here is a flowchart um, describing the process. 
Uh, first, the applicant creates an account and answers water quality and water rights questions. Once the applicant submits the application, they'll receive a notice of receipt, one for your Division of Water Quality Permit and one for your Division of Water Rights Permit. They will have site-specific fee amounts and or exemptions. Once a payment is received, staff reviews applications and contacts the applicant if additional materials or clarifications are needed. Once all application deficiencies are resolved, applicant receives the NOA for the Division of Water Quality and or their SIUR certificate from the Division of Water Rights. It is important to note that although both the water quality and water rights applications are on the same portal, they are reviewed by different staff. Next, please. Here, for some spatial reference, we have a distribution of our permits. On the left side, we have water quality, and the right side, we have water rights. You'll see in water quality, the green dots are actually for outdoor grows, while yellow are for indoor grows and they are distributed throughout the, the state with a concentration of outdoor grows in the north coast. For water rights, you'll see that this mostly concentrated in the north coast because that is where the majority of surface water diversions occur for cannabis. As we move closer to Southern California, they are more um, concentrated on wells. Next, please. Our permits are not contingent on any other agency, so you can actually apply today. In some cases, if you're using exempt sources, you can get your exemption documents in 10 to 20 minutes. Additionally, here are some of our social media contacts. Uh, we have an Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Next. And here are some of our contact information, the first being water rights. So if you have any questions about the SIUR process, feel free to reach out to the Cannabis Registration Unit. And on the bottom, we have Division of Water Quality contact information. So if you have any questions about getting your notice of applicability or just the general order in general, uh, reach, feel free to reach out to those numbers. So I'll leave it here for just a quick second if you need to take pictures of these contacts. Next, please. And here are some important links. So the first is the online portal. The next is the Handbook for Forest, Ranch, and Rural Roads. Remember, if your roads are designed and maintained in a fashion that is compliant or consistent with the Rural Roads Handbook, they are not considered disturbed areas. Uh, we have some more information on the general order with attachment A and overall general information. And with that, I conclude my water rights presentation. Thank you for your time.